the dogs have their their famous uh, dog movie, which we're which we're going to show you now, and we will we will narrate it um, for you as as it goes through, and then we'll show you some slides, talk a little bit about the mission, and uh, invite you to share with us uh, as best as best as it can be done through the medium of of the film and, and the slides, uh, the terrific experience that you made possible because the people in this room and, and a lot of them who aren't here, of course, because they're doing other things, are the people who deserve the credit for this uh, and many other successful space flights. And uh, we, we are operating uh, as part of a team. I'm really proud and pleased to have some of that team here. And uh, I know that you all are going to do terrific work henceforth uh, for the rest of the folks and, and for the rest of the missions coming up. With that, I think we can, we can roll the movie and probably bring down the house lights. Ah, the laser pointer. There's our patch. It was a challenge uh, to come up with a good patch for this mission, but we, we think we did. And now a quick view of our suit up process. Uh, you saw me there, and there's, there's Cujo, Ken Cockrell. Most of you all know the dog names. <laughs> That's probably underdog. And, <laughs> and there, of course, is Pluto. And last but not least, my payload commander, Dogfish. Uh, we were happy to be going flying. As you know, we'd had a few little bumps in the road getting there. But finally walking out to a resounding chorus of woofs at the Kennedy Space Center on the 7th of September. The training team might be pleased to note that this is one event we made on time. And <laughs> the main engines uh, starting up and the vehicle twanging forward on the launch pad and uh, five screaming uh, young men heading off to orbit. Sort of young, anyway. <laughs> we had some interesting atmospheric conditions that weren't really evident to us as we were going uphill, but they did create some good blow visualization of the Mach waves on uh, the rough parts of the, the shape of the vehicle around the booster nozzle or the booster cones and <coughs> and just above the cabin uh, creates some shock waves as we're going through Mach 1 and, and going past the speed of sound. This is kind of a rough part of the ride, uh, very exciting. The boosters let you know for sure that there's a lot of thrust back there. When they separate, the ride smooths out a bunch, uh, but it's only just part way beginning. In fact, uh, there's six and a half more minutes of uh, powered flight to go and uh, lots more that can happen uh, as the training team would be glad to share with you uh, from this point on to orbit. Once we get on orbit, we have a lot of things we had to do and we had a tremendous number of things to get out and get ready for our flight. Uh, Dave and Cujo were up on the flight deck reconfiguring the, the uh, digital processing system and getting the orbiter ready for orbit operations and Underdog was downstairs looking for something to eat. <laughs> uh, Jim was reconfiguring, uh, getting things set up. This was the ergometer. Uh, we had a lot of things to get out, put in place, take out of the lockers, and get ready for our orbit operations before the next day when we started our primary payload ops. This is the, uh, our first major payload uh, of, the, of the mission, the Spartan. It's a solar science satellite uh, aimed at studying the solar wind and ultimately its effects on satellite communications and the weather on Earth here. Uh, it was a great satellite. It was all uh, autonomous, so all we had to do was unberth it and uh, turn it loose, and then it went off and flew around and did its thing for a couple of days. Um, you'll see a little bit later, it actually shut down a little bit early. As it turns out, we got 95% of the science done, though. And that's out the aft flight deck window um, during the release process. It did a little pirouette where it rotates uh, clockwise and then counterclockwise to signal that everything is okay. And uh, it was really beautiful to see the thing as we separated from it and to look back down at the earth and see this little satellite scooting along. It's a great sight. I might mention that thanks to excellent training, among other things, Underdog did a perfect job of uh, deploying the Spartan. We had a lot of secondary experiments that we did while the Spartan was out. One of them was the uh, commercial generic bioprocessing apparatus. It's a large tube filled with a bunch of small test tubes that have different experiments in them. You turn the crank to activate the, uh, each tube, and then later we turn the crank to fix the things that had done their thing in zero-g. Then they're all brought back 
to uh, evaluate the effects of zero-g on all these different experiments. This is a, a mass measurement device that uses a linear acceleration that it times to figure out how much something weighs on orbit. It's uh, kind of like getting the miniature uh, cat shot, so a couple of Navy guys here uh, reliving old times. <laughs> Here's one of our more interesting <laughs> One of our more interesting experiments, the training team remembers vividly me going around seeking victims for this while we were practicing prior to flight. But it actually is a, a, a way to test blood on, on orbit or any place in a field situation with this portable clinical blood analyzer, nifty little gadget. Um, in the training for it was actually kind of tricky because uh, there's a lot more to taking blood uh, than one realizes and we were able to do it pretty well on orbit, although some pain was inflicted. <laughs> yeah, this is the Spartan rendezvous. We're returning to pick up the spacecraft, and uh, it was, as we mentioned earlier, a perfect deploy. The rendezvous itself wasn't nominal. Let me let uh, Underdog talk about the grapple here. Basically, uh, things went, went uh, real well. Um, it was spin a little bit, and uh, between the training that we'd had and then the incredibly uh, proficient teamwork amongst the whole crew, we did the fly around and did a, a rate uh, track and capture uh, very successfully, and, and uh, uh, I was real proud to be part of the team on that one. This is the birthing of the Spartan, which went pretty much like we expected, and uh, after that exciting uh, rendezvous and grapple, we were real happy to get that that sucker clamped down in the payload bay. <laughs> this is a view back Florida in the background in the uh, Bahama Islands, Andros Islands, particularly in the center of the, center of the screen. And just to the lower right of that is the deep dark blue is the tongue of the ocean. A very spectacular uh, view passing over the Bahamas in Florida. With the Spartan uh, back in the bay, it uh, perfectly blocked our direct viewing of the wake shield, so we had to pull the wake shield up uh, uh, from behind the Spartan, and then uh, it's going to grow some semi. It was planned to grow some semiconductors, so we took it off to one side into the ram in order to clean the very clean side of it, the uh, the wake side, and use the atomic oxygen in low Earth orbit to clean it. Then we moved it over to the other side in order to test out the attitude control system. Uh, after getting through that, uh, Mike running the systems and uh, me running the arm at that point. We brought it up to, uh, to the overhead deploy position in order to do a gravity gradient deploy, for which one of the awards was given earlier. The, we didn't touch the, the attitude control system on the orbiter for uh, about five hours prior to deploy and then for a few hours after that as well. The arm is now clear of the wake shield. It turns on a two ounce nitrogen gas thruster and it thrusts away from the shuttle in order to maintain that very clean environment which we had set up. Uh, we were able to track it using the, the laser out to about 15,000 feet, and Dogface holds the record for that. This is the Wake Shield Science Center, and we had two computers which uh, we used to uh, command and process the data. This is a little work on the mid deck uh, Jim Rowling and Mike working with a secondary experiment. Yeah, this was the CMIX experiment, and it was always a great challenge to uh, hunt down these uh, test tubes that kept coming loose because the Velcro didn't work well, but uh, the science was really, was really great. One of the things that we worked on was a uh, crystal that could result in a drug that could prevent the spread of breast cancer, and uh, so we we're real, real happy to be working on that. <laughs> we did get to exercise a, a fair amount on this flight, and when you don't have uh, gravity to constrain you, you can ride your bike almost any way you want to. <laughs> Dave is uh, studying a little bit on the mid-deck there, and as we're going to pan around and take a, a quick look at part of the orbiter wide web, this is the mid-deck uh, implementation. That's the, uh, the global positioning satellite, PGSC, on the right, the computer that allowed us to tell where we were quite accurately using the onboard GPS receivers. To the left is the Goddard PGSC, which allowed us to command the Goddard payloads. Now it's time to bring back Wake Shield, uh, more, more realistically to go and get it. This is the view out of the commander's window, uh, the overhead window, window uh, nine. You can see the gun sight appearance of the COAS there and the, the Wake Shield itself out in the, out in the ether. 
we could always see it, even though we were 30 miles away at times, it, it shone like a bright star, it was very, very visible. And uh, we, because the Spartan rendezvous had been a bit challenging in some parts, particularly the prox ops, were very confident and comfortable, again, due to a lot of good training and simulation and the fact that the flight control team had worked very closely with us setting this up. So the rendezvous and the prox ops went very nominally, um, unlike some of the wake shield uh, science operations. And we got uh, into close proximity. It's really a beautiful satellite. We have some, we have a gorgeous it's, view coming up here shortly, I think. Yeah, the sun was eclipsed there by the wake shield and has just come out right before sunset. The, the free flight of the wake shield was challenging and, and we gave uh, awards out for that today and we're very uh, proud to, to have that help. It really made a difference in the entire operation of the wake shield from beginning to end. There were challenges uh, at every uh, step of the way, but we're confident with their help that they'll be able to take that information back to the wake shield program and help them get a really good uh, flight on their next flight, wake shield three. We did grapple the wake shield. Uh, we did another day's worth of experimentation with it, uh, looking at the charging of the wake shield in order to help assess the impact of charging of spacecraft uh, in that uh, environment. Of course, while you're on orbit, you have to eat, and we're provided with this uh, galley arrangement here that lets you rehydrate dehydrated food and also warm it up if it needs warming up. And here I am. I must be fixing some food for Underdog. And, and, uh, Pluto's eating in bed again. <laughs> Mike spends a lot of time contemplating what he's going to do, and uh, this is some cream of mushroom soup. I think it's really very good, but he took a while to decide that he was actually going to eat it. This is getting ready for the EVA, preparing our helmets with some anti-fog. A lot of equipment that we had to get ready for it. We spent six to eight hours getting all of our equipment and tools ready to go outside. Uh, here we are preparing some of the tools, the rigid tether in my hands. Uh, and Jim Newman had a hope that Mike's shoulder wouldn't get better and he'd get the opportunity to go outside. <laughs> it didn't work out that way. <laughs> If, if there was any chance of him doing it, he just lost it when we shoved him under there because we banged him right into the airlock. <laughs> this is a shot in the airlock with Mike and I almost ready to go outside. We spent about 40 minutes pre-breathing in there. and uh, Here, Cujo is closing the door on us, shutting up the hatch and sealing it up before we go out. And here's Mike headed out the door. Now, we didn't know if it even had an automatic closing thermal cover. One of the first things we did was um, remove a debris shield from a task board, and you see that right here. Um, really, all of the, the tasks we did were excellent, and uh, as a sort of a midterm exam of where we're headed for space station, I think we're in really good shape. We were pleasantly surprised by essentially everything that, that we did. Um, there's a shot of me maneuvering the debris shield and we tied that off on the forward bulkhead. There were two major objectives to the EVA. One was testing tools and procedures for space station. All of those worked extremely well. And the other was the uh, thermal environment for the suit, testing modifications to the suit and seeing if they worked. Here I have the rigid tether on with a, a, a PFR attached to the end of a, a total foot restraint and a large mass. It was a pretty awkward uh, arrangement that we had to then put behind us to translate down the sill. And here Mike is, he's very stationary. If you look just to his, uh, the left of his elbow, you see the body restraint tether, which is a device used to hold you in place in orbit, and it works very well, holding, held you very rigid. This is uh, d during the thermal of Allen. We had the opportunity to spend 45 minutes hanging upside down on the arm, and uh, I can tell you the view was just exceptional. And uh, that's probably the last chance we'll have to actually spend 45 minutes doing nothing but observing. Moving the guys around on the end of the arm was, a, was, a, was kind of fun, actually. If I found if I moved them quick enough, I could shake them loose. <laughs> Which he did a couple of times. <laughs> it was a great view, and uh, the EVA went very well. When we were done, we had to clean up all the mess we'd made out in the payload bay. We had to pack up. Mike was taking off one of the thermal cubes to measure the thermal environment. And the sack I have in my hand has all of our tools. It was a great tool bag, and we carried that back to the airlock for putting everything away. 
We were out for uh, about six and a half hours and accomplished all the major objectives for the EVA. It went, besides being a great experience, it went very well. And this is the final stages of uh, ingress. Uh, it was uh, a great experience and um, uh, I think we're in good shape to, to do the station. This is back in the airlock and buttoning things up to come home. <laughs> We had to put everything away after we got back inside, clean up the suits and, uh, for the possibility of having to reuse them again. We weren't so lucky. One of the good things you can do when you have people in space is to look out the window and use your mind to figure out what's a good thing you could take a picture of and what might help geologists, meteorologists, and uh, all kinds of uh, scientists on the ground in their study of the Earth. This is the tip of uh, Somalia and one of the single tombolos that sticks out into the Red Sea. Uh, from a meteorologist, meteorologist point of view, the, uh, our flight had great opportunities to see two large hurricanes. One was Luis and this one here is Maryland. Luis was so big you could hardly see it all uh, through one window. It, it covered more, almost more than the horizon. We also had a small problem you may have heard about with our potty. Uh, we had to dump our water into a bag, and this is us getting ready. That's a filter that's attached to a tube that then gets attached to a bag. At this point in the flight, I felt like I had done just about everything you could hope for on your first flight, but no, and we got a chance to <laughs> excel at being space plumbers. <laughs> Underdog found out why plumbers make so much money. <laughs> <laughs> the what? cabin stowe was uh, getting ready to come home. We we're pulling all the bags out of the airlock and trying to find places for them. So we we're stuffing them into the sleep bunks and, and arranging them to try to get ahead of the timeline. The Diorbid prep timeline is fairly tight. So the day before, we pulled all the uh, bags out and uh, actually buttoned up the airlock. And here is a, a gorgeous shot. Fortunately, we had some great photographers on board, both uh, Cujo and Dogface are exceptionally good photographers. They captured some, some great scenes, and this one sort of was a nostalgic one for us because we're getting ready to come home. A great experience at an end. We had tried hard to milk the program for another day, but we just couldn't do it. And here's the entry. Uh, this obviously is late in the entry. Uh, Ken had a great view of Houston as we came over it. By now, we're in the range of the long-range optics from the Cape. Um, and this is approaching uh, the hack turn. In fact, it's probably on the hack now. We made a right-hand turn entry uh, to runway 33 at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, kind of a personal triumph. I've been trying to land in my home state ever since my first mission. And uh, the last two have gone to California, so we were glad to get back to, to Florida with this one. The weather was really good. We got great support from the entry team, making sure the weather was good and that all the facilities were good. And finally, returning to light at the Kennedy Space Center. Really, really enjoyed the whole flight and the culmination of it here to land on Florida soil was really nice. There not being any place to land here in Texas. Shoot came out. We hardly had to use the brakes because the chute worked really well. We had a little tailwind, so we rolled quite a ways, but we knew we were going to stop, so we took it easy on the brakes and rolled down pretty close to where the convoy was and stopped. At uh, 69 knots, we uh, jettisoned the drag chute, and you do it at a little bit of airspeed so that it pulls cleanly away from the engine bells because this, after all, is a reusable spacecraft. It was the ninth space flight of uh, Endeavour, the 71st space flight of the shuttle program. And the uh, second dog flight. <laughs> and the second dog flight. <laughs> <laughs> Everything about this patch was a challenge, including getting it produced, and it's still a challenge for some people to figure out which way is up on it. It's supposed to be oriented so that the shuttle is going straight up, but it almost never gets projected that way. Um, the two constellations that you see there are Canis Major and Canis Minor. We considered it uh, a small triumph over bureaucracy to get that through headquarters without anybody complaining about that. <laughs> they, um, 
We wove the 69 motif in there, we think, very subtly. Uh, we were later accused of having attracted hurricanes by putting the... <laughs> and we did attract quite a few. But uh, the, the colors of the flag and the colors of NASA, the, the wake shield uh, is, and the Spartan are both represented by the, the vaguely satellite-shaped uh, center depiction of the astronaut symbol. And of course, we have our favorite spacecraft going up and coming down safely depicted there. Uh, I might mention that Underdog wrote a, a beautiful uh, piece of, of uh, verbiage to go along with this to send it up to headquarters to get it approved. And uh, for those of you who have the stickers and the patches and uh, the crew pictures, that stuff is, uh, is on the back there. He, he did that, and I was impressed with the way that worked out. Here we are lifting off. Uh, a gorgeous shot. Every time I'm amazed at how, how good the photography is. And, and I'll mention here, those boosters that you see working so well there, if you'll remember, we had worries about pre-flight. Uh, an absolutely terrific effort on the part of everybody from the Thiokol folks to the Cape folks to the people here who made sure it all was checked out properly uh, to get that booster situation resolved and get us some fine boosters. And as most of you may have heard, we found the boosters uh, to be in perfect shape after the flight. Okay. This is our payload bay, and you can see all of our payloads. It's not a very good picture for Earth OBS, but for the bay it is. Uh, down at the bottom is the Spartan closest to us. Behind it, the wake shield. You can see how difficult it would be to observe it if you were down in front of the Spartan. And then behind it, another payload we haven't talked about yet, the uh, IEH, International Extreme Ultraviolet Hitchhiker which had a lot of different science payloads on it that uh, Cujo was responsible for and primarily involved maneuvering the orbiter, pointing the instruments at uh, celestial objects for taking all of its science, and it proved to be very successful also. The bay was quite full. And in front, which you can just barely see in front of Spartan, is our uh, EVA development flight test task board, which occupied the forward bays of the orbiter. Well, um, this is the the fun part for me, I guess, because I get to talk about my crew, and they are a terrific lot. Uh, one, of the, one of the thrills for me on this flight, uh, Cujo and I both being naval officers, uh, got a chance to promote our favorite Army officer and make him a real bird colonel. Um, this was set up uh, with cooperation from the flight control team and the Army Space Command, and uh, we wanted to make sure everybody could tell that it was done in space, so we got him upside down and took his picture. <laughs> and uh, that uh, was a highlight for me. Uh, Dogface and I flew together on my previous flight, and he did a terrific job. It was pretty meaningful for me being a career Army officer to be promoted in space. You can see his university. Uh, he managed to sneak Auburn <laughs> posters into every single picture that he's in. <laughs> If you look carefully in the back, you can see the, uh, the Auburn poster. Could just taken over control of the field. <laughs> Underdog, our rookie, um, he reluctantly acknowledged that he was a rookie towards the end of the flight, just after we gave him the contingency wastewater uh, <laughs> IFM. He said, OK, fine, I'm a rookie now. <laughs> I can't get out of this. But Mike came to us with a lot of undersea experience, which was helpful in the EVA. He came to us with uh, credible science uh, PhD and a, a ton of native intelligence, which we used extensively for, for a guy on his first flight, he was really challenged. Uh, primary responsibility for Spartan, wake shield systems responsibility, arm operator, EVA. Uh, it's a, it was a wonderful opportunity for him. He rose to every challenge. He's going to now go do terrific things, I think, in the space station era. And it was a, uh, he's a close personal friend of mine before the flight, and the friendship was cemented during it, and just really proud to have had Underdog along, and uh, he learned a lot and in the process. I think he did manage to hit all the, all the corners of every square uh, that could be filled as a rookie, and he did them all just perfect. Cujo, uh, who used to call himself Taco, and, and his mother called him Ken, but I don't think anybody's called him since, <laughs> um, was a joy to fly with, the perfect PLT. He covered all my mistakes up as well as anybody could and flew really well when uh, I tried to give him opportunities to fly because I knew he would fly beautifully, and he did. He uh, did his share and more of the science. He helped pull the team together at every, 
at every turn. Uh, he managed the most complex photo TV setup that I've ever seen in a space flight, and he did that all with incredible skill and aplomb and told some of the worst jokes that I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life. Um, he's, he's not gonna let me talk about it anymore <laughs> at that point. Pluto, our science officer, um, manager, uh, owner, operator of the Orbiter Wide Web. Uh, we had probably, probably the world's largest collection in orbit anyway of small computers. He made them all sing. Uh, he was also the MS-2 uh, consummate flight engineer, did a terrific job on the wake shield deploy and managed the wake shield science and did the best that anybody could do to uh, make sure that that went smoothly. He wasn't able to make it go smoothly, but he was, with the help of a, of a great team on the ground, able to salvage a lot of it and uh, I think carry on uh, a, good, a good concept into the, into the future. I uh, can't think of enough things to say about Pluto. We, we named him that. Uh, it was really a compliment because his orbit was so far out that none of us could even begin to keep up with him. And he, everything he did, he did uh, as so well that we were started logging his little mistakes when he would make one in order to see if we could catch him at something. Finally did, because he didn't know what a proboscis is, but <laughs> it took that long, and that was eight days into the mission. Uh, uh, we didn't, we don't have, a, and I'm sorry we don't, uh, a picture just of Dave, but uh, we have sitting to my left here the uh, finest shuttle commander you could hope to fly with. He's, he's a lot of fun. He takes care of his crew. He takes care of the people that are working with us and working for us, and uh, he's just a joy to be around and, uh, and fun to try to keep up with. Uh, anybody out there that's a, a fellow crewman, you do well to fly with this man. Yeah, that's a great compliment. Well, let's move on to some great pictures of the Earth, and I'm going to turn it over to Cujo for that because he was the photographer and Earth observer par excellence. Well, I mentioned during the movie that uh, it's a great opportunity to, uh, to have humans in space and to be able to look down and with intelligence uh, such that, well, I guess we had dogs in space this time, but anyway, with some level of intelligence, look at uh, something interesting that's happening on the ground and take a picture of it. It's a picture of, an Am of the Amazon River and another, another river that runs parallel to it. Uh, and South America was remarkably cloud-free, so we got some great views for the Earth OBS uh, office here at JSC. These are called von Karman vortices, uh, just simply the shape that clouds take uh, as the wind blows over an island. Near the bottom of the picture is Guadalupe Island off the coast of Mexico. And when the wind is the right speed, about between five knots and 13 knots, and when you have a high pressure system holding a, a cloud layer down close to the, the island itself, it creates this uh, very interesting vortex pattern uh, in the wake of the island. As we mentioned, we saw some great shots of uh, two large hurricanes. The biggest was Luis, and this is Luis. And we didn't have a camera lens that could see it all at once. Very impressive uh, system. Sure glad that it didn't go even over any more populated area than it did. It was a beautiful thing for us to look at. We had to stop and remind ourselves that there are some people down there that aren't thinking this thing is quite as beautiful as we were. This is an interesting photo in that it shows what you can see and pick up on very quickly and that you may never realize this from, from a ground point of view. But this green area, which stands out in the deserts of Oman, is, is a result of some recent and very unusual heavy rains that occurred, probably because the area that's green is higher terrain. And as the uh, moist onshore wind at a certain time of the year blow, blows, it, it uh, creates uh, rainfall, or graphic lift, lifting that creates rainfall. And it, it gives you a good insight as to what could be going on with the land in, in uh, countries that are really not accessible enough for us to really monitor any other way except from Earth orbit. Same thing for the uh, Sinai Peninsula. And of particular note in the, in the Nile River Valley is this floodplain here that's sort of shaped a little bit like a heart. And each shuttle flight that goes over this uh, can get a photo of it, and the Earth OBS group can monitor the relative size of this floodplain and, and get a good idea of what's going on as far as rainfall upstream in the Nile and, and what you can expect from Egypt and other countries along the Nile for crop production that season. 
This is uh, a picture of literally hundreds of center pivot irrigation uh, fields. Wells are drilled straight down into the earth. You see these out in West Texas and uh, New Mexico as well. But uh, in Saudi Arabia, they're, they're done extensively. And there's a mixture of fields currently in productions and, and fields that aren't in production. Perhaps the uh, water has dried up in the area of those wells. Some of those wells go down 3,000 feet to tap into the ancient uh, aquifer water supply below the desert. And finally, a couple more pictures. This is in uh, the city of Surabaya in Indonesia. We took it once with uh, color film, and you can see the city right here. Uh, you can get a good idea of the kind of effluent uh, that's in the water using the color film. And then we had another shot using the color infrared film. And using the two, two different kinds of films, you can bring out different contrasts. And the contrast that color infrared brings out the best is that between what shows up as red, lush vegetation and, and rich farm fields, and the, uh, the blues and greens of, of areas that are either have less vegetation or have been stripped of their vegetation. Well, we've about come to the end of our presentation. We, this sort of symbolizes our feelings about humans in space and the eventful mission that we had. Uh, we can see here uh, one of our men in space in, in the, actually this was taken when we were in our thermal uh, testing. And uh, mm -hmm. underneath is Marilyn. Uh, we can tell that because we can see most of it. If it was Luis, we'd not be able to see anything but uh, the hurricane. Um, and another gorgeous shot, uh, which we view with, with nostalgia for, for having had a wonderful time on orbit. And uh, we wish that we could take every one of you with us up there. Uh, you are there in our hearts. And uh, we thank you for having made it possible for us to have done this. There's home plate uh, in terms of landing, gorgeous view of Florida. Uh, which we took just before the end of the mission. We were checking our own weather um, the day before, actually. And uh, finally, during the entry, out the overhead window, using my kneeboard mirror, Mike and I could see the uh, plasma trail behind us. In addition to the orange glow that en envelops the uh, orbiter, the plasma trail stretches uh, hundreds and thousands, actually thousands of miles behind us, as anyone would know who who got up that morning and watched a streak across the northern uh, Houston sky. We found it particularly uh, wonderful to be passing over Houston in the pre-dawn darkness. I haven't done that since my first flight. Uh, that time we went south, this time we went north, and Cujo had the good view out his window of, uh, of looking down at Houston and could see that we were crossing home and uh, people that we've talked to subsequently talked to us and it was kind of neat that they had gone out and looked at this and had gotten back inside just in time to see us land on TV at the Cape. It gives you some appreciation for how quickly the orbiter crosses uh, the Earth and how much energy is being harnessed uh, by man's technological capability uh, for our use, pleasure, and, and mankind's benefit. Uh, again, uh, humans can do some pretty terrific things when they set their mind to it as teams. And finally, here we are uh, at the end of what was for us a very pleasurable and, and we think uh, for NASA a very successful mission. Thanks to you. This, uh, this represents for us the fact that every shuttle mission is only a part of the big picture. Uh, here's the moon. Uh, the moon, Mars, the outer planets, and the stars are where we believe we ought to be going. Uh, we took another small step in that direction with this flight, and each subsequent flight will be playing its role and making its contribution, as you will, uh, to that eventual goal. And thanks again for being here, for all you did, for listening to us, and for all you will do from the dogs.